This video was brought to you by the amazing people who support Pim on Patreon. You should give us your money too. Give us your money. Give us your money. Give us your money. Give us your money. A while back I watched the British 2021 horror film Censor. The censor in question is a woman who gradually loses her grasp on reality as she tries to uncover the connection between her long lost sister and a series of increasingly unsettling VHS tapes. It's a pretty good film. I think I liked it more when it was made by a bunch of Swedes though. <laughs> Science. <laughs> Evil Ed came out in 1995 and is also about a censor who gradually loses his grasp on reality, as he's tasked to edit and cut a series of violent splatter films. The title is jokingly referring to the 1981 film Evil Dead, and it approaches the subject of horror movie censorship from an equally silly perspective. The gore is nasty, but over the top. The acting is more Pornhub than Paramount Pictures, and the whole idea that anyone could turn into a hallucinating murderous villain simply because they consumed too much horror fiction is, contrary to censor, only played for laughs. Edward is literally the only person in the film who has such a strong reaction to horror films, and it doesn't appear to be because he's watched more or even anything particularly worse than what his colleagues are watching on a daily basis. Well, there's also Edward's predecessor, who resigned by putting a hand grenade in his mouth. You're fired! It's a film that's simply too outrageous to be taken seriously. It's obviously not entirely unproblematic. The subgenre of exploitation seldom is, as the name suggests. There's at least one racist joke that kind of comes out of nowhere. There's the classically ableist portrayal of mental patients. And if you know anything about this particular subgenre, you're already aware of how a lot of the women in the film are portrayed. Evil Ed is not without its merits, though. The significance of this film, and more specifically its contentious main message, can and should be discussed in relation to what, at least at the time, was the greatest moral panic in Swedish history. It feels like such an exaggeration to say out loud, but that's the nature of moral panics, isn't it? They are, inherently, reactionary. It starts with a country or even a worldwide wave of sudden fear among the public that eventually ebbs away with the wisdom of hindsight. That's the best case scenario anyway. In hindsight, this particular moral panic seemed inevitable. In 1911, the Swedish government established Statens Biografbyrå, or the state's cinema agency, making it the very first state-owned agency of its kind. Its purpose was to edit films based on contents that were viewed as uncomfortable or morally damaging to children and adults alike. They basically enforced the Swedish equivalent of the Hays Code. Since the day film was introduced to the Swedish public back in 1897, it had gradually earned the status of being a working or underclass leisure. There was a genuine fear that the uneducated masses would be easily ensnared by dangerous ideas, violent as well as political. This was a time of global revolutions after all, like the ones in China, Portugal, Egypt and Russia. And as we all know, challenging the status quo is definitely bad and something you should never ever do because we're living in such a good and stable world right now. Even the Swedish Social Democratic Prime Minister Per Albin Hansson warned about the film's ability to give the kids hashtag brain rot. For this reason, some of the earliest moviegoers would actually be accompanied by police. Although, it was up to the state's cinema agency to make sure that such precautions wouldn't be necessary in the long run. Just to put things into perspective, the first Swedish film to be completely banned was the 1912 silent film Trädgårdsmästaren, or The Broken Spring Rose, in which a woman who has been sexually assaulted returns to the perpetrator after which she commits suicide at the scene of the crime. It would take 52 years before the agency would ban another Swedish film, the 1964 drama 491, which follows a group of adolescent criminals. Then of course, there's perhaps the most well-known example, the 1973 rape revenge film Thriller, A Cruel Picture. There were obviously a lot of films that were merely edited during this time. Even these three were eventually allowed to be shown as well, two of them after having received extensive cuts. The message these cases sent was clear though. The exploitation subgenre, or anything with a slight resemblance to it, was not welcome within Swedish movie theaters. 
But then there were the VHS tapes, which severely lacked the sort of legislation that theatrically released films had. When home video was popularized in Sweden, there was no stopping it. Suddenly, almost anyone could get their hands on and expose themselves to some of the most gruesome images ever put to film, completely untouched by the state censors. The amount of these tapes only grew, which with time made them a prime target for political debate. The Brits refer to this trend as the video nasties. In Sweden, a country where we eventually grow out of using baby words, we simply refer to it as the video violence. And it was when this topic was discussed on the debate show Studio S back in the 1980s that shit really hit the chainsaw. Right off the bat, the sensationalist angle is revealed, as a young kid shows up on screen with scary images floating in front of their forehead, followed by a narrator who asks this provocative question. Ska 11-åringar få se sadistiska våldsfilmer på video? Wait, that's the whole question? <laughs> okay, so if we disregard how oddly specific the choice of age group is, it's as clear as a frying pan to a forehead with floating images of screaming faces in front of it what kind of mindset the show attempts to put you in as you start watching it. The people behind the show have already made up their minds about what they think and what you should think about video violence. And it's that it's not only bad, but especially harmful to children. It's an airtight argument. If you try to counter the claim that video violence is bad, or suggest that there should be some nuance to the discussion, you'll simply come off as someone who isn't thinking of the children. And what kind of a monster would not think of the bloody children? The host then demonstrates just how easy it is to expose yourself to these harmfully violent scenes. You just pop a tape into the deck, press play, and watch as a random act of uncensored murder appears on screen, with no context to speak of. This is one of the most apparent issues that permeates the rest of the show. It's not just that the debate is based on individual graphic moments rather than the films in their entirety. The debaters themselves, mostly consisting of worried parents, openly admit that they know nothing about these films apart from the moments they are shown in the studio. One of the politicians says that he's only seen fragments of the films beforehand which is a nice way of saying that he simply imagined how terrible they are from second-hand accounts. You'll even hear someone inaccurately assert that the films are directly made for and advertised towards children. Even though I'd assume that at least some directors of violent films would agree with Quentin Tarantino in that they wouldn't mind if kids saw their work, I don't think that anyone has ever made a deliberately horrific splatter film with the sole purpose of having younger children watching them. The show never bothers to entertain this idea. Instead, they keep pushing the narrative that children are not just exposed to video violence and that it's dangerous, but that Swedish rental shops are actively selling it to them. Two pairs of kids are interviewed after having left two different rental shops with violent titles such as Kill Alex Kill, A Taste of Hell, and Psychic Killer. Although the most worrying evidence for the effects of video violence comes from interviews with a larger group of children who've actually watched these types of films. Boogeyman and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre being among them. As they're standing on the schoolyard, all packed together, they almost gleefully describe the events of these films, albeit somewhat or completely incorrectly. Sure, Pam gets stuck to a meat hook in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and it is implicitly stated that Leatherface is going to shred her with his chainsaw. But not even in the uncensored version is this act visually depicted. But that's besides the point. When some of the kids are interviewed separately from their classmates, that's when they dare to open up about the fears and nightmares they've been having since they watched the films. Clearly, something had to be done. And according to the parents back in the 80s, it was a job for the politicians, 
rather than themselves. Now, it's easy to say that these parents, and parents like them, are stupid for not seeing or taking responsibility for the media habits of their own children. However, it's important to remember where all of this started. It was the Swedish state who put the responsibility on itself to make sure that citizens were quote, protected from morally damaging films. It's not strange then that these parents were expecting the state to keep protecting them, especially now that the shield was starting to crack. This was simply the norm. And suddenly, it was getting challenged with full force, as former film censor Ann-Kathrin Agebeck put it. In the United States, it's always been more allowed to show violence, since it's also such an important element of American society, as in the right to bear arms and the right to defend yourself with retaliation. I would say that if we didn't have as many American films in Sweden, the supply of violent films wouldn't have been that big. Many of these films were about vengeance. They were about a single person who'd been the victim of a serious crime of violence who turns to the authorities for help without receiving any. Then they take the law and justice into their own hands. That was, of course, contradictory with the idea of the Swedish welfare state. Here in Sweden, we've always taught our children that if they're ever the victims of violence, that they should not hit back. You should come home, tell us what happened, should we talk to your teacher, the boy's parents, we're going to discuss this and get to the bottom of it. Ann-Kathrin is obviously describing a very idealized version of Sweden here, but I think that it reflects how a lot of people felt, and to some extent still feel, about the differences between Sweden and the US. Films like the ones that were picked out for the Studio S debate showcase some of the most decadent and vile aspects of American culture. So when Sweden became a target for American cultural imperialism, there was a somewhat justified fear that we would adapt some of those aspects to our own culture. These people, the showrunners, the parents, and the politicians, may not have been in the right, but they genuinely thought they were doing the right thing. Hell, the show was even broadcast on one of the only two Swedish TV channels that existed at the time, both of which were state-owned. They viewed it as a public service, as a morally defensible moral panic. And sure enough, laws regarding violent videotapes were established as a result. The cinema agency was even granted on-the-ground representatives, whose job it was to visit various video retailers to make sure that they were not selling anything they weren't allowed to, either openly or under the counter. All while people on television and in newspapers kept insisting that violent videos were dangerous that they could lead to real-life violence, and even that war films were found in the home of a real-life serial killer, which obviously proved some kind of correlation. However, this fear-mongering turned out to be insufficient. As mentioned previously, the amount of violent films being made and distributed wasn't exactly waning. Not to mention the fact that the Studio S debate had not only created a moral panic, but a not-so-insignificant Streisand effect. People who had never heard of these films, but who had an interest in blood and gore, were suddenly hugely aware of an entire market exclusively tailored to them. By the early 2000s, the state cinema agency wasn't cutting that many films anymore, apart from pornos. And in 2011, it was disbanded altogether. In its place, a newfound media council was to focus on general media consumption among children and teens, which they're still doing to this day. So that's it. Some parents got very mad back in the 80s, made some legislation happen, and then it was all dropped by the turn of the century? That doesn't sound particularly dramatic. Well, what if I told you that the Studio S debate was deliberately based on a lie? In 2002, two of the children who were interviewed by Studio S went on a different show called Film Kronikan, or The Film Chronicle, where they revealed that their whole segment on the show had been manufactured, and that they had in fact been shown images from the films they were meant to talk about by journalists from Studio S. In an attempt to have the kids give believable accounts, Studio S themselves were the ones providing the nightmare fuel. Both admit that they were just kids who wanted to be on television, that they would have said almost anything for the attention. The third kid, however, was apparently saying nothing but enthusiastic things about the films, which is why the camera barely bothers to acknowledge him. With this in mind, the integrity of the whole broadcast collapses. Sure, it might have been true that those other kids were actually able to rent videos only meant for adults, but it's just as likely that these parts were completely manufactured as well. Studio S's smoking gun backfired. 
22 years too late. By the time that these news aired, the damage had already been done, but it was also in the process of being undone. The responsibility of protecting children from what was perceived to be harmful content had started to shift from the state to the parents. And after that, there was no turning back. There is some conflicting testimony worth mentioning, though. In a 2010 interview with a Swedish horror site called Rysarnytt, former Studio S reporter Stig Lindell rejects the idea that there was a purposeful attempt to subvert reality, and blames the poor production of the show on a rushed two-week production schedule. While he seriously doubts that the kids were ever shown any violent scenes by Studio S, since he was present at the time, he admits that the kids weren't taking the interview very seriously, and really just wanted to be on television. There's also a less than satisfying quote by the former chief of Studio S, the late Erik Eriksson, that he gave in response to the film chronicle. If it is true that reporters put words in the mouths of interviewed people, then it is contrary to sound journalistic working methods. I did not know then that it occurred at Studio S, and I still don't know if it has occurred. What I am sure of is that children as well as adults are affected by watching grossly sexualized violence against women. He would then write a debate article where he firmly stated that there was in fact no lying in the Studio S broadcast whatsoever, and that it was the film chronicle who were twisting the truth in a condescending and simplifying manner. It's ironic considering that even without the alleged lies, the whole reason why the moral panic started in the first place was because Studio S made a severely reductive and uninformed case against video violence. How does all this connect to Evil Ed then? Even if the film never explicitly mentions the Studio S debate, it's pretty clear that it revels in the absurdity of the whole thing. It takes the idea that violent horror films could twist the minds of the masses and flips it on its head. As the producer and co-writer Jöran Lundström said around the time of Evil Ed's release, The film asks a question. Does a normal person go crazy from watching films? Does one get such an impression from watching a violent film? In that case, the state cinema agency is full of crazy people. That cannot be the case. I could do without the slightly ableist wording, but Jöran is absolutely right. If violent films had the morally corrupting effects that Studio S and others warned about, wouldn't the people whose job it is to literally watch them five days a week be affected most of all? This is why I personally find films like Censor or Barbarian Sound Studio to be a little silly, in a way that I don't think is entirely intentional. While they use the profession of the film censor to explore topics like memory loss, past trauma, taking potentially dangerous steps outside your comfort zone, there is this underlying, self-serious message that horror films destroy people. It's like how slasher films generally speak to people who have a liberal view on fictional violence and gore, while simultaneously feeding conservative morals like don't have sex before marriage or don't do drugs. Evil Ed sidesteps the issue by conveying its message in such a way that Edward's gradual psychological descent can't be read as anything else but parody. The closest thing to a villain, apart from the evil Ed the film is named after, is a guy the end credits refers to as Bondage Face, who encourages Edward to remove the minds of those who create video violence. The bad guy essentially wants the same thing the real-life parents, politicians and censors wanted, through a slightly more aggressive method. That it's Jöran Lundström who plays this character, as in the same guy who publicly made the point about film censors being in the wrong, makes the point even more potent. By the end of the film, Edward, who has completed his evil transformation, can no longer distinguish reality from fiction. Even the doctors and nurses who are trying to help him at the hospital look like literal monsters to him mirroring and mocking the outdated view of the censor as someone who self-righteously protects the public from themselves, to prevent people from turning into monsters. The irony is that Nick, the character who finally takes Evil Ed down with a shotgun blast to the face, is an enthusiastic horror fan who works at the same company as Edward. The message really couldn't be any more blunt. Despite both having sat through hours and hours of horrific spectacle, it's the censor, who believes horror to be harmful and who never enjoyed or understood it, that succumbs to fear and darkness. Not the avid viewer who finds joy and excitement in the genre. In the end, the Studio S broadcast and Evil Ed have the same thing to say. Sometimes, those who react the strongest 
are those who know the least. That's not saying that horror films can't affect people. They absolutely do. So do most things that we're exposed to. Whether it's societal norms, commercials, or political propaganda. Horror films can potentially feed you harmful ideas about women, mental health, or that quote ugliness can be directly related to the concept of evil. Things I've previously made some videos about. They won't turn you into evil Ed though. The filmmakers knew it, horror fans knew it, and eventually, the Swedish state knew it. Evil Ed is not just a critique though. To me, it feels like a love letter to American horror-themed schlock. It's not exactly a high-budget production, but it's by no means a low-effort production. Especially compared to Swedish horror films of today, which are so low effort that they don't exist. The film has been described as having a budget that compares to two and a half seconds of Jurassic Park. And they really did the best they could with those two and a half seconds. What the gore lacks in complexity, it more than makes up for in amounts. The monster designs are surprisingly well done, and pleasantly goofy looking for being in a Swedish film. And the cinematography and lighting makes sure to show all that work in its best light. Director Anders Jakobsson admits that he might have been a bit more interested in how the shots looked rather than what the actors were doing. It shows because the film looks so good at times. It has this distinct aesthetic that makes it very easy to spot what film it is simply by looking at a single frame. In the same interview where Jöran Lundström talked about the message of Evil Ed, a representative of the Swedish Film Institute was invited to point out that, while the institute actually gave it financial support, it's a quote, dumb film that will only appeal to people who are uneducated. Even 17 years after the Studio S broadcast, they couldn't just let someone talk about a violent film they had made. It had to be a debate. This by far upsets me more than the parents who were worried about their children. Violent horror films may show you some of the worst qualities human beings can have, and it's completely fine to not want to watch that kind of stuff. Claiming that films like Evil Ed are dumb, however, is to claim that the violence doesn't mean anything. It absolutely does. Whether it conveys political or societal criticism, or simply aims to satisfy a morbid or artistic curiosity, horror, video violence, or whatever you want to call it, has always been full of meaning. Evil Ed is a genuine achievement in this regard. Not only is it a fun exploitation slash splatter film that could easily be interpreted as pointless, it simultaneously manages to summarize and criticize one of the most pivotal TV broadcasts in Swedish history, in a way no debate article ever could. And it does this in a way that comes off as effortless. From an outsider's perspective, Evil Ed might look like one among hundreds of thousands of similar horror films. For us Swedes, however, it was a breath of fresh air that sadly hasn't been properly replicated since. The one film that is at least superficially similar is the short film Kung Fury, although it's not exactly horror. Apparently, the Swedish film industry felt that it was more important to pump out new entries in the propaganda franchise Beck four times a year. Wait, I'm sorry, it's apparently pronounced Beesk. Speaking of, I wonder how many films there are in that series now. Are you fucking kidding me? Beck is back. No shit! This says something though, doesn't it? Even today, as I'm recording this video, there is apparently still this underlying fear of the Swedish public becoming unruly. To the point that so much effort in the Swedish film and television industry is put into projects where cops are treated as morally complex, but ultimately good and necessary heroes. The Swedish Film Institute released a study in 2020 that concludes that the average amount of Swedish moviegoers who went to see Swedish films in theaters between 2015 and 2018 was 16.8 percent. By looking at the types of films and shows we're primarily producing in this country, this number isn't particularly surprising. There's a severe lack of modern genre films in Sweden. Evil Ed, in retrospect, felt like an attempt to change that. But sadly, it didn't succeed. The state's censorship tool is long gone, but no Swedish filmmaker has fully taken advantage of that in the past decade. Just like in the early days of video violence, us Swedes mostly get our fix through imports. The more things change, the more they stay the same, I guess. Well, at the very least, we will always have Evil Ed, right? Not Thank you so much for watching, and a special thanks to each and everyone who supported me on Patreon through the making of this video. 
Here are some of those people. Nichtschwert, Rocky Dennis, Tobias Mattsson, Håvard Krugerud, Professor Flowers, Winders, Mackenzie Pollock, Eliza Tentevi, Rob Robbins, Seth Sard, JK, Kiggy Dharma, Choco Demon, Eben Phantom, Mechathug, Julian My Julian, Elizabeth V. Haste, and Nick Owens. I also want to thank Laura Crone, Embrace of Shadows, and Kiki from Transparency for lending their voices and afterthoughts and questing refuge for proofreading the script. You'll find all of their links in the description. I want to cover more Swedish horror related stuff in the future, so if you have any suggestions about that, feel free to leave a comment below. I have some plans already. One of my Patreon goals, for example, is to cover the film Let the Right One In, something I've looked forward to for a long time. So, yeah, look forward to that if that happens. Until then, I hope to see you in the next one. Cheers.